Settlements. This word is associated with many other names, both negative and positive. West Bank, Judea and Samaria, occupation, disputed territories. In this mini series on settlements, we're going to unpack the ideas behind those controversial terms. Today, many consider the settlements to be at the very center of the Israeli-Arab conflict, while others view this as a red herring, that blaming the settlements is simply an excuse for a longer held opposition to the existence of any Jewish state. We'll explore all that, but in the first episode of this five-part series, let's dive into some of the more fundamental questions, like what are settlements and how did they come to be? Today, settlements refer to Israeli towns, villages, and cities in the West Bank, an area also sometimes called by its ancient historical name, Judea and Samaria. This land was generally Jewish, hence the term Judea, until the Romans expelled the Jews about 2,000 years ago. Over the centuries, the land lay remarkably desolate and undeveloped, with a small but increasingly Muslim and Arab population. There was also a significant Jewish population in some places like Jerusalem and Hebron. But the real story of the settlements starts way back at the end of the 19th century when an influx of Jews began immigrating to the area known as Palestine. For centuries, Jews all over the world had dreamed of returning to the region, their original homeland. But they were faced with a complex situation. There were already people living in Palestine. In fact, Arabs had been living there since the Muslim conquest of much of the Middle East in the mid 7th century. Still though, the total population was pretty sparse. By the late 19th century, approximately 400,000 Arabs and 40,000 Jews lived in the area referred to as Palestine, which was then a region controlled by the Ottoman Empire. This only changed at the end of World War I when the region fell to the British. The British were tasked by the world powers to administer the land under what was then called the Palestine Mandate. They tried to keep a lid on the region, but didn't go so well. There was infighting, riots, and revolts on both the Jewish and Arab sides. After the Arab Revolt of 1936, the UK began working on a plan for partitioning the land. And after hearing testimony from both Jewish and Arab representatives, they proposed allocating 75% of the land to the Arabs and roughly 25% to the Jews. The Jewish leadership was pretty divided, but ultimately accepted the proposal, while the Arab leadership rejected it immediately. By 1947, the UN put forth a new partition plan to create one Jewish and one Arab state, with about 43% of the land set to go to the Arabs and 56% to the Jews. The Jews reluctantly accepted the plan, but to the Arabs, the attempt by an international institution like the UN to allocate any land to the Jews was plain old Western imperialism. They rejected it and war broke out immediately, before the British even left Palestine. The fighting lasted five months until May 14, 1948, when the British finally lowered their flags and departed. At that point, Israel declared its independence on the section of the land that had been assigned to them by the UN. The combined armies of the five surrounding Arab countries attacked the tiny new state with the goal of driving the Jews out completely. Ultimately, the result of the war would end up determining the boundaries of the new state. Although the Jews won the 1948 War of Independence, it wasn't exactly smooth sailing from then on. The West Bank was annexed by Jordan and Gaza was taken by Egypt, and the local Arabs were not given independence. Any Jews who had lived in those regions were driven out, their communities dismantled, and their land confiscated. Israel's northern villages were regularly shelled from the Syrian-held Golan Heights, and terrorists from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank regularly infiltrated the border to carry out attacks against Israeli civilians. These terrorist attacks were part of the reason for the little-known Sinai War, also referred to as the Suez War, of 1956 in which Israel conquered the entire Sinai Desert and Gaza from Egypt. Now, they eventually returned it all in exchange for an international guarantee that Egyptian waterways would remain open to Israeli shipping and that UN peacekeeping troops would occupy the Sinai Desert as a sort of buffer zone between the two countries. Still though, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser didn't let up on his military plans and rhetoric. And then, in May 1967, Nasser began moving Egyptian tanks into the Sinai and ordered the UN peacekeeping troops to immediately evacuate the Sinai, which, to the bewilderment of the Israelis, they simply did. Israel was now exposed as Egypt continued moving troops, tanks, and artillery towards Israel's southern border. Israel's leadership was pretty not sure how to react. They wanted desperately to avoid a war and sought international diplomacy to avert the crisis. But any international help was slow in coming and far from guaranteed. About a week later, Nasser set up a blockade to cut off vital Israeli shipping routes. This action clearly violated UN Security Council Resolution 118 and was an internationally recognized act of war. Nasser was pretty open about it, stating, our basic objective will be to destroy Israel. Still, for two more weeks, Israel continued to seek international intervention. But as diplomatic efforts failed, many Jews feared they were on the verge of another Holocaust. A few days before the war on May 30th, Nasser announced, today they will know that the Arabs are arranged for battle. The critical hour has arrived. We have reached the stage of serious action and not of more declarations. Israel had to face the fact that diplomatic efforts had failed and ordered a preemptive attack on June 5th. 
The Israeli army destroyed the Egyptian air force, which allowed the IDF to sweep through Gaza and the Sinai Desert. Soon, Israel had reclaimed all the land that had returned to Egypt 10 years earlier. Prime Minister Levi Eshkol immediately sent a message to King Hussein of Jordan that if Jordan stayed out of the war, Israel would leave them alone. But King Hussein was under immense Egyptian pressure and turned down Israel's offer and launched multiple attacks. Now, there was serious debate in high command about what to do with Jerusalem. Israel didn't enter the war with any plans for reclaiming the old city of Jerusalem, but opposition leader Menachem Begin pleaded with Eshkol, our soldiers are almost in sight of the Western Wall. Future generations will never forgive us if we do not seize it. Eshkol agreed, and Israeli troops crossed the 1948 armistice lines, fighting their way to the strategic Mount Scopus overlooking the old city. After the 1948 war, Jordan had evicted the Jews from the ancient Jewish quarter of the old city and had barred them from visiting their holiest sites. But now, the Israeli paratroopers descended Mount Scopus and soon, for the first time in 2,000 years, a united Jerusalem, Judaism's holiest city, was back in sovereign Jewish hands. The army then moved through the West Bank, securing the cities of Hebron, Bethlehem, and Gush Etzion. Soon, IDF tanks climbed to the Golan Heights in the north as well, from which Syria had been firing at northern Israel ever since 1948. Syrian defenses crumbled. In six days, Israel had tripled its size. It now had control of three major regions, the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, the Old City of Jerusalem and the rest of the West Bank from Jordan, and the Golan Heights from Syria, giving the state more defensible borders and reducing future threats significantly. But the Six-Day War was a victory that came with a lot of complications. As you can imagine, opinion in Israel was pretty divided about what to do with this land, not to mention the Palestinian Arabs living there. But unlike 1956, this time Israel wasn't going to let go of the land so easily. It had several new issues to consider, and these issues would ultimately lead to the settlement movement. First, the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria, had deep historical and religious significance to the Jews, more so than the Sinai, Gaza, or the Golan Heights. Israelis felt they had a unique claim to the heartland and birthplace of the Jewish people. Second, this land had been conquered in a defensive war. To many, this meant the new 1967 lines were no less legitimate than the internationally accepted 1949 border. At the time, international law made it illegal to conquer territory in an aggressive war, but that didn't apply to a defensive war, which this was. Israelis had faced the annihilation of their state, and now they had won. Only 20 years after the Holocaust, Israelis felt that they had finally achieved the promise of never again. And to solidify this promise, many were moved to settle the newly acquired lands. A third consideration was that much of the land Israel had conquered had no previous Palestinian independence. The West Bank, for example, had been occupied by Jordan ever since 1948. Israelis now asked themselves, why should they return land to Jordan, an enemy country that had no legitimate claim to it? A fourth major consideration was the trade-off between security and hopes for peace. When Jordan occupied the West Bank highlands, Israel's narrow width made it possible for an attacking country to easily cut the country in half. But now, with the West Bank in Jewish hands, Israel was much wider. Meanwhile, holding Gaza and the Sinai in the south and the Golan Heights in the north as security buffers helped prevent the terrorists and artillery shelling Israel had faced since its founding. Many Israelis felt they could not give up this degree of security without some guarantee of peace, and military analysts agreed. And some felt that by settling the land and forming blocks or communities, they would both enhance security by their presence and make it difficult for the Israeli government to ever relinquish land that they saw as vital to that security. Which brings us to the other side of the equation, the hope that by holding on to the territories, Israel would have powerful bargaining chips that it could eventually exchange for peace. These hopes turned out to be irrelevant at that time because three months after Israel's victory, Arab leaders passed the Khartoum Resolution, famous for its three no's. No peace with Israel, no recognition of Israel, and no negotiation with Israel. So, for now, the land would remain disputed or occupied, depending on who you ask. To many, since there had been an Arab population in parts of the region for centuries, they should be entitled to self-rule even if they didn't have it in the past. To them, the disputed lands are occupied. On the other hand, those who viewed these territories as vital for security, as being won in a defensive war, as having a deep historical Jewish connection, and as having had no previous Palestinian Arab sovereignty, those people viewed the word occupation to be way off base. So with the land in Israel's hands and Arab rejection of any negotiations for peace, new developments began. For a long time, Zionism's pioneering spirit of settling the land had been secular. But now there was a new frontier and one with so much religious significance in the heartland of the biblical homeland. Soon, a new group of religious Zionist pioneers would take the helm. Through them, the settler movement would be infused with and fueled by religious passion and faith. Many religious Jews saw this as a historic moment they couldn't possibly ignore. The dawn of the Jewish return after long exile described by the ancient prophets. 
But this settlement movement was still going strong too, and the first place they chose to resettle was Kfar Etzion in the Judean hills. The Jewish community of Kfar Etzion had been massacred in the War of 1948. The settlers arriving now in 1967 were the children of those who had been massacred. They were literally returning home to the place where many of them had been born. Meanwhile, the religious settlement movement continued to grow, and in 1974 formed a political entity known as Gush Emonim, or the Block of the Faithful. Fueled by the newfound pride of being able to live in all of their ancient homeland and brimming with euphoric hope, Gush Emonim continued to settle communities in Judea and Samaria. But in the words of author Daniel Gordis, there was a sense that the conquest was more complicated than the euphoria suggested. We'll explore these complications in later episodes, starting with a crucial question. What exactly is the Jewish connection to the land that has fueled the settlement movement? And why does it seem to hold so much influence? For now, thanks for watching.